Okay, welcome back to Math E102. Um, Chris and I graded all the quizzes yesterday and were very pleased with the results. Uh, this wasn't the same quiz I gave last year, but I thought it was of the same difficulty and the results were um, substantially better overall. Uh, there were a couple of people who got perfect scores, very few people uh, who seemed to be thoroughly lost. And uh, you know, basically, on the, I graded the third and fourth questions. The scores on the last question were remarkably good. People really had the infinite series stuff under control. And uh, also, on the third question, uh, that rather messy bridge counting stuff, people had the mechanics largely under control. Uh, for the handful of people who do need to take the repeat quiz, here's the deal. I'm going to send it to everyone who took the quiz and got 15 and a half or less. If you got 16 or better, you couldn't possibly improve your score because the maximum possible score from the repeat quiz is 15. You are? So. There you go. Andrew Zhang. Okay. So uh, what I'm planning to do is this. Since I've announced it for Sunday, uh, early Sunday morning, I will email a PDF file of the quiz to everyone who either took the first quiz and got less than 16 or who has notified me that in spite of not having taken the original quiz, they want to take the makeup. The quiz is going to be accompanied by a form that has to be signed by a witness. And this form says, basically, I certify that so-and-so didn't spend more than one hour on the quiz, including time studying the PDF file online before printing it. And then my preferred mechanism for returning it is after the hour is over, you stuff it into an envelope, uh, have your witness uh, sign across the back, and bring the envelope to me next Tuesday. If that doesn't work, you must have some mechanism by which you're handing in homework, and you should just submit the quiz by the same mechanism. OK, uh, tonight is going to be devoted to difficult but highly entertaining problems in conditional probability. Uh, these, I hope, are the sort of things you will be unable to resist bugging your family and friends about, and they won't understand how it works or why you're so excited about it. But you will, and that'll make me happy. So uh, the first one is Wisdom of Solomon. And uh, this one I want to act out as a script. Uh, so I, I will start with uh, the text and then we'll bring people up to implement this. So, uh, A reading from the first book of Kings. Now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great retinue, with camels bearing spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she told him all that was on her mind. And she said to Solomon, All these spices and gold and precious stones I will exchange for one true prophet. Now there were in Jerusalem many prophets, true prophets who spoke nine parts truth and one part falsehood, and false prophets who spoke truth and falsehood in equal measure. But only Solomon himself was without any falsehood. Now the way I've implemented this is I've got two true prophet kits here. And in a true prophet kit, there are nine red cards and one black card. If you are asked a question, you're supposed to pick a card at random from that deck. If you get the red card, you tell the truth. If you get the black card, you tell a lie. The false prophet kit, of course, contains equal numbers of red and black cards. Sturzacher in the text is forever poo-pooing these applications to questions about lying people. And I think the psychology can be questioned. But if you make the mechanism precise enough, these are perfectly good probability problems. And if there were prophets running around with decks of cards to decide whether they should tell the truth or not, this would work perfectly well. I think the fact is, if 
you say about someone, oh, uh, she lies a third of the time, such an individual is probably more likely to lie about, have you ever considered cheating on a quiz, than what does 2 plus 2 equal? Whereas in this model, uh, you're equally tell, likely to tell a lie, no matter what the question may be. So we got these kits. And Solomon had sent his servant into the city to gather three prophets from which the queen might choose. So I now need someone who will act as Solomon's servant. And we're going to need lots, practically the whole class is going to get involved in this little drama. So who will be Solomon's servant? Come on up here, okay? okay? Now, it's your job, sir, to find three prophets, and you make two of them true prophets, and one of them a false prophet, and each of them has to know which is which. Do I have to know? You don't have to know, but it really, no, you shouldn't know. Okay, so so just, you, should get, you yeah. should pick people, get them out, let them compare notes with one another, and then you come back. Okay, so you go off and do your thing. Oh, you uh, you've got to get three volunteers. Okay, well, Okay, and we need someone to be the queen of Sheba. This is sort of a bit part, but we might as well do the proper job of this. Who will be the queen of Sheba with the great retinue and all the camels? Anna, how about you? Okay, Okay. so you can come on up here. You're, you're the customer. Okay, now, servant, you have to come back with your three prophets. Okay, how do we know which ones we have? Oh, I see. You guys can know. Okay. Yeah. I, well, I don't know, because I just came to yeah. Okay, uh, verse 6. The servant returned with three prophets and said to Solomon. <clears throat> said to Solomon, I cannot return. No, no, oh, here. Oh, okay, master, two of these are true prophets, but one is a false prophet, and I have forgotten which. Now, when the queen heard these words, she was dismayed and said to Solomon, I cannot return to my land fearing that there is one chance in three that I have chosen a false prophet. One chance in ten would be acceptable. Therefore, command your servant to find more true prophets before I make my choice. My servant is weary and deserves to rest, replied Solomon. But I will question one of the prophets to learn more about who is the true prophet. How can that be? Asked the queen. Since any of these prophets might speak falsehood in response to your question. Solomon then addressed the first prophet. Excuse me, when you read, can you read into the microphone? Oh, oh okay. Up here? Okay. Sorry. This one right here. <laughs> Solomon then addressed the first prophet, saying, Is the second prophet a true prophet? The first prophet replied, saying, Okay, now. <laughs> this is this is slightly risky, of course, because I might not get the answer that's in the notes, but I can deal with either case. Okay. Um, okay. She is a true prophet. She is a true prophet, okay? Solomon took the second prophet by the hand, saying, I know that there remains one chance in 15 that you are a false prophet. Nonetheless, you are likely to bring credit to Jerusalem as you serve your new mistress. And King Solomon gave to the Queen of Sheba all that she desired, whatever she asked, besides what was given to her by the bounty of King Solomon. So she turned and went back to her own land with her servants. Okay, so you can sit down and I'll now analyze this. Sex. <laughs> and with the chance device as I've implemented it, this analysis is 100% uh, clean. As you noticed, I did this as adult ed an adult education course in, in my church. And the catch with this is you have to rewrite the Bible in such an outlandish way that it probably has little real theological applicability, but it sets you thinking in right directions. Okay, so uh, fortunately, I prepared for this case. Uh, so we've got Wisdom of Solomon here. And the case I'll do first, I'm going to call case two, because case one is in the notes, is that prophet one says prophet two 
is true. So this is the opposite from the case that's in the notes. OK, now what do we have? My servant went out, and he had two true profit kits and one false profit kit. And these were handed to the three people, who were then sort of randomly arranged as profit one, two, or three. So there are three equally likely outcomes. And here they are. There's A1, A2, and A3. Each of them has a probability of one third. Call that P of A to the I. And the first case will be the one where profit one is true, profit two is true, and profit three is false. And let's figure out, for this case, the probability of the given statement, which I have called uh, see, let me use exactly the same notation as in the notes. Uh, event B. is that profit 2 is true, and event C is profit 1 says profit 2 is true. Um, this is all case two. This is case two because I got the answer, yes, profit two is true, whereas the one I wrote up in the notes was the opposite one. OK, so in this case, true, true, false, what's the probability that profit one will say that profit two is true? Yes? Sorry, I missed, what is AI? AI are these three alternatives. The three alternatives are the false profits in slot three, in slot two, and in slot one, respectively. Oh. So the, the, see, these are the three equally li likely outcomes. The secret of doing these problems is always to identify the right collection of equally likely outcomes. And here we know there are two true profits and one false profit, because we saw my servant give out the kits. And they were scrambled randomly. So any one is equally likely to be profit one, profit two, and profit three. And now we can use the information, because we know that Profit 1 tells the truth 9 tenths of the time. Profit 2 is a true profit, and profit 1 knows it. So what's the, pos what's the probability that he gives this answer, the conditional probability? Nine, Nine tenths. tenths. Everyone happy with that? And we can also, if we want, work out the probability of C intersect a sub i, which is 9 tenths times 1 third. That is, 9 tenths of the time, this will be the actual case. And in those 1 third of the cases, we'll get the answer we heard 9 tenths of the time. OK, here's the second case. Uh, the second profit is a false profit. And profit 1 uh, ends up telling me a lie and saying, no, profit two is in fact a true profit. In this case, the queen's going to go home mighty unhappy. What's the prob conditional probability of that? One tenth. One tenth, right? Because profit number one is a true profit. This will happen only if he pulled the one and only black card out of his deck of 10. So the conditional probability is one tenth. And we have one tenth times one third. Yes? 
question. Is this, this is supposed to be following the notes in the outline? No, this is. This is a different case. This is the other case. Okay. The note, I, I will do the case in the notes next, but that was a risk that I ran when I staged this live. I have to live with the answer I get. The interesting thing is Solomon can pick a true prophet with probability 14 fifteenths in either case. Uh, but this one is not written up in the notes. I'll do the, uh, I'll do the one in the notes second. OK. Now here's the last case. Uh, if prophet one had been the false prophet when Solomon asked the question, 50% chance of the truth, a 50% chance of the lie, what's the conditional probability in that case of getting the answer we heard? One half. Or five tenths. And so we have five tenths times one third. Now, what's Solomon working out? You know, this isn't the world's wisest man for nothing, folks. Solomon's shrewd enough to figure out that the conditional probability that matters is the conditional probability of B given C, right? I'm going to pick prophet number two and go out on a limb and say, this is almost certainly a true prophet. And the information I have to go on is that prophet number one said so. OK? This is the probability of B intersect C over the probability of C. And that's really pretty easy to work out because can someone give me a formula for B in terms of the A's? A1 or A2? A no, you're close. Prophet 2. What's an expression for the event B? Prophet 2 is a true prophet in terms of the three events A1, A2, and A3. A1 union A3. A1 union A3. Thanks, Jerry. And this is a disjoint union, so I just have to add the probabilities for those two. That's. 9 tenths times 1 third plus 5 tenths times 1 third. And then we've got the probability of C. What's the probability that prophet 1 will say that prophet 2 is true? Well, we've got the probability of C intersect each of the A's. The union of all the A's is the universal event. So we just have to add all these together. 9 tenths times 1 third plus one-tenth times one-third, plus five-tenths times one-third. And the one-thirds cancel out everywhere. And so, so to the one-tenths, we get 14 over 15. And if you're looking for an easy way to understand this, I found one. What's the only way that Solomon could be wrong? Solomon is wrong only if prophet 2 is a false prophet. If prophet 2 is a false prophet, the guy who's giving me the answer has to be a true prophet telling me a lie about it. And he'll only do that one chance out of 10. So Solomon has a very high probability of being right. And I have to say, I learned, this, I learned a simpler version of this problem from one of my teaching fellows. And when I first heard this, I thought, there's no way you can get that much information out of one question. And finally, after about 15 minutes of scribbling, uh, I realized this is, there are three women of which two are honest women or something like that. But the honest women always tell the truth, which makes it simpler. And uh, you can find an honest woman with probability one by asking the right question in that case. And I realized this problem I'd been given was a special case of a slightly more general situation. And I dreamed up this one. Okay. Any questions about this, the way it worked out? OK, now, uh, Solomon, world's wisest man can, or wisest man of his era, can deal with any situation. Yes? So you, you said that B equals um, uh, the union of A1 and A3, but. Um, <coughs> Oh, okay. Okay, because those are the two cases. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I was just looking at the top of the of the the expression of B given C 
And that's, I, I was thinking that was the probability of B, but that's the probability of the intersection of B and C. I was wondering why it looked like you had directly intersected, the, directly substituted the probability. No, I put in, I added together this probability and that probability because the probability of B intersect C is the sum of the probabilities that, of the different A's of which B is the unit. OK, so let's try the other case. And because I know that it's very hard to take notes if I make subtle replacements on the blackboard, I'm going to clean the whole thing and redo the table. So we now have case one. This could have happened. Profit one says profit two is false. And now, in that case, as it says in the unrevised version of this, uh, Solomon took the third profit by the hand. Because the interesting thing is, if Solomon gets the other answer, profit one says profit two is a false profit, then pro Solomon has a conditional probability of 14 fifteenths of getting a true profit if he picks the third one. So in this case, the event we're interested in is profit three is true. And uh, the statement here is profit one when asked, is profit two a true profit, says no, profit two is a false profit. So we do it exactly the same way. We've got a1. A2 and A3. Each of these events has a probability of one third, and they're the same as they were before. Third profit is false. Second profit is false. First profit is false. And you should now be quite good at working out the conditional probabilities. So what is P of C given A1? Given this setup, what's the probability that profit 1 says profit 2 is a false profit? One tenth. One tenth. Because profit 1 is a true profit, would have to tell a lie to make that statement. Now, do it all with fractions. So we've got one tenth here, and one third times one tenth for the probability of the intersection of C at A sub i. Second case, profit 2 really is a false profit. And when Solomon asks this profit, is profit 2 a true profit? Profit 1 says no, telling the truth about it. What's the probability that that will happen? Nine tenths. And the probability that this is the actual setup, that profit 2 is the one and only false profit, and that this statement is made as 1 third times 9 tenths. Now we come to the last case where profit 1 is a false profit. Given that profit 1 is a false profit who's got a deck consisting of equal numbers of red and black cards, what's the probability that he'll answer yes to any question that Solomon might ask? 1 half. Now we've got to get our B again. B is that profit 3 is true. And what is B in terms of the A's? A2 union, oops, A2 union A3. And now we can do the calculation just as before. The probability of B given C is, as always, the probability of B intersect C divided by the probability of C. OK? B intersect C is the sum of these two. That's 1 third times 9 tenths plus 5 tenths. The probability of C is the sum of all three of these. 
one third times nine tenths plus five tenths plus one tenth, and you cancel out the one thirds, you cancel out the tenths, and you got fourteen fifteenths again. Yes. Uh, just the, the the way that you got the probability of C, you said that. So that's the union. That's the the sum of the unions of of C and and A sub I. Yes, because um, if you want to look at it formally, the probability of C is the probability of C intersect the universal event. Okay. <clears throat> And that's the probability of C intersect A1 union A2 union A3, which I can then expand into the sum of this and this and this. That is, basically, if you want to know the probability of a given event, this is going to be very important later in the class, which is why I'm giving you an unexpectedly long answer. You can take the union of that event with a collection of events, a disjoint collection of events whose union is the universal event, a disjoint partition, and add up all those individual probabilities. And there's really no way of getting the probability of C in this case short of breaking it down into the three cases that you can analyze. Okay. Any questions about this before I go on to the next one, which is even more bizarre? OK. Uh, this next one, and this is the next topic, is known as Eddington's controversy, or since Eddington came from the other side of the Atlantic, I should probably say Eddington's controversy. Uh, this is nicely described in uh, the textbook, and I'm going to stay away completely from what makes it a controversy. Apparently, Eddington disagreed with the orthodox answer that I'm going to give, but it's a quibble about what the meaning of the verb deny is, and I'm going to restate the question to finesse that particular issue. So, uh, now I've got four Eddington kits here. So, now I need Four volunteers to be A, B, C, and D. Who will be A? Don't open these yet. Who will be C? Who will be B? Who will be C? We can't run this class without C. OK, Emily, you're C. And who will be D who starts the whole process off? Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. OK, now here's the deal. Uh, we are in a country where everyone, though, the way it's stated is all the men, but I think that's sexist and obsolete, where everyone lies two-thirds of the time. This is a country of habitual liars. And uh, your first reaction when you hear that is that anything you take probably has precisely one-third chance of being true. Because if everyone tells the truth one-third of the time, then even if there's uh, statements being made about statements, about statements, about statements, it seems reasonable that uh, anything I hear has a one-third chance of being true. And this shows that in at least one case, there's a statement that has a conditional probability of 13 firsts of being true. It's always interesting to find math problems that lead to large prime numbers like 41 in the answer anyway. so. Here's what happens. Now, this scenario is kind of hard to follow. So uh, who is D? OK. You need to make a statement whose uh, truth or falsehood can be verified by C. So in your Eddington kit, your Eddington kit contains uh, one red card and two black cards. And 
the question I'm going to ask you is what does 2 plus 2 equal? And you pick a card at random and loud enough so that C can hear it. If you draw a red card, you tell the truth. And if you draw a black card, you tell a lie. So what does 2 plus 2 equal? 41. OK. So uh, now, C, who heard that? Who is C? OK, Emily, you're C. Now, um, you know whether D told the truth or a lie. But you've got to pull out your Eddington kit. If you get the red card, you make a true statement about whether or not D told a lie. But if you get a black card, you have to lie about what you heard. This is getting kind of complicated. So pull a card from your deck. He told the truth. So you say he told the truth. Yes. OK. And that may mean he told a lie and you're lying about it. Or it may mean that he told the truth and you're being truthful about it. OK. Now, who, who is B? Right here. You heard what Emily said. <clears throat> Emily said uh, he told the truth. But you are going to uh, make a statement to A about this. And you pull out your Eddington kit. If you get the red card, you make a true statement about what Emily said. But if you get a black card, you tell a lie about it. Um, she told the truth. <laughs> OK. So you are asserting that she said that D told the truth. Because she said that D told the truth, and you're saying that that's what she said. Um. <laughs> you can understand why lawyers don't like hearsay evidence. <laughs> so she, she said D told the truth. That statement may or may not be false. You're just reporting what she said. Uh, and so what did you say about what she said? She told the truth, which means he's lying about her statement. Yeah, I, whoa, whoa. But that, yeah, see, I don't know. I, I said she told the truth. No, what you, what you want to do is either say she said that D told the truth or she said that D told a lie. Oh, OK. Well, uh, depending. What she said was D told the truth. But if you lie about it, oh, you well, can say. Well, well, she said D told the truth. And what are you saying about what she said? Um, yeah, she told the truth. OK, so you got the red card. OK, good enough. Now, A heard this. and. <laughs> Who is A? Who is a? I, Eddington was a great theoretical physicist with a highly convoluted mind. So now you have to report what uh, B said, truthfully or falsely, depending on what card you pull. Just what he said? Well, if you get the red card, you say B said that C said that D told the truth. If you get a black card, you say, B denied that C said that D told the truth because you need to tell a lie. OK, so pull your card and make a statement. OK, so uh, you say, so here we have the actual situation has occurred that B A asserts that B denies that C claims that D was telling the truth. Okay. So does everyone see how the scenario works? If you don't understand how the scenario works, you can't understand this problem. Because Eddington's actual statement was, A asserts that B denies that C claims that D is telling a lie. And the question is, given that A makes this statement, what's the conditional probability that D was selling the truth? And um, while Sirzacher explicitly disavows this line of reasoning. I maintain that people do this all the time. They get communications through noisy channels and try to figure out what's the conditional probability, given what I've heard, that something really happened. You know, the White House press secretary said such and such and such and such. Given that the White House press secretary said this at that time in this way, what's my estimate of the conditional probability that such and such actually happened? Uh, so we do this all the time. And this is just a rather convoluted example of it. OK, so here are our events. But this is number four. 
And look, folks, the main justification for this is it's fun. It gets you thinking about conditional probability, and it gets you thinking about things that are so complicated, you could say, no one could possibly reason it out. And by using appropriate formalism, you get an answer you can believe. But uh, I don't want you going off to law school in hopes of being able to apply this. Uh, it is largely for fun. So here are our events. Events A, B, C, and D are respectively that individual is telling the truth. And the event that Sturzacher calls S sub A is uh, a clean restatement of Eddington's uh, far-fetched statement. It is equivalent for S sub A to be that A says that B says that C says that D is telling the truth. You could think about this on your own time, but it is generally believed that this statement is logically equivalent to Eddington's A asserts that B denies that C claims that D is telling a lie. Okay, what do we want? We want the conditional probability of D given S sub A. In other words, this fellow made some statement about the sum of 2 and 2. It went through three noisy channels. And what came out of the last noisy channel, channel A, was this statement. And we need to know the probability of D given S sub A. And this is, of course, the probability of D intersect S sub A divided by the probability of S sub A. And in order to put numbers into this, it is crucial to know that everyone tells the truth with a probability of one third. And I had my decks of cards rigged so that you know that was the case in our experiment. OK. How many individual outcomes are there? Two at every, no. Well, there's there are two at every level. So how many individual outcomes of this experiment are there? Two to the fourth. Two to the fourth or 16. But they're not equally likely. If we wanted to make them equally likely, we actually could in this situation because we use the cards. If we wanted equally likely individual outcomes, how many would we need? 81, 3 to the fourth power. Because the 81 equally likely individual outcomes are D pulls card 1, C pulls card 1, B pulls card 1, A pulls card 1, and so on. But it's much simpler to say there are 16 individual outcomes namely A, B, C, or D might separately each either be telling the truth or telling a lie. OK? Then it's 50%. And I think in that case, uh, the answer may turn out to be precisely 1 half. So it's a rather dull problem. OK, so uh, let's look at the uh, different situations.
Suppose that nobody lies. How many of the individual outcomes have the property that there are no lies involved? One, okay? So there's one case where everyone tells the truth. What's the probability? One over three to the fourth, because everyone has to tell the truth. If everyone tells the truth, then D tells the truth, C reports truthfully that D made a correct statement, B reports truthfully that C said that D made a correct statement, and A telling the truth says B said that C said that D was telling the truth. So in this case, S sub A is yes or no? Yes. yes. OK. And in uh, this case, if everyone tells the truth, what's the probability that D in particular is telling the truth? One. One. OK. OK, let's do the second easy case. Everyone lies. D says. 2 plus 2 is 41. C lies about it and says, D gave the correct answer for 2 plus 2 equals. B lies about it and says, C says, A gave a, the D gave a phony statement about arithmetic. And A lies about that and says, B says that C says that D told the truth. So if there are four lies, there's one case like that, what's the probability that all these folks are lying? Two-thirds to the fourth power, because they all independently tell lies with a probability of two-thirds. And in this case also, A makes this statement. And in this case, what's the probability that D was telling the truth? Zero. Zero. What is, what is, what is yes? What are you saying for that? I'm saying that in each of these cases, we can figure out whether, will A, whether A will make the given statement. If everyone is lying, A ends up saying, in effect, uh, B said that C said that D was telling the truth. It's a lie, of course. But it's a lie about a lie about a lie about a lie. OK. Uh, you're starting to catch on. Now let's think about two lies. OK. D tells the truth and says 2 plus 2 equals 4. C reports truthfully. D made a true statement about the sum of 2 plus 2. But B, who lies, says um, C said D was telling a lie. And then A lies about that and says B claims that D was telling, that C says that D was telling the truth. So if there are, that's a particular case where there are two lies. And A will make the given statement in that case also. <laughs> And it turns out that in every case where there are two lies, that A will make this statement. Another thing that could have happened was D says 2 plus 2 equals 41. C lies about it and says D correctly stated the sum of 2 and 2. And then B repeats that correctly, and A repeats that correctly. And you can think this through on your own. But no matter where the two out of four lies occur, A will make the given statement. And that's the secret to understanding this same strange question. If there are an even number of lies, A makes the given statement. And if there are an odd number of lies, A does not make the given statement. Let's think about a couple of cases where that happens. If you use negative and positive because you've got a positive outcome and a negative, and you got an even number that you get two negatives, make a positive and a positive, and fundamentally that's right. And if I were really good at symbolic logic, I could probably mystify you all by writing obscure symbols on the board to prove this. But I think it's 
It's probably simpler just to look at a couple of examples, and then you can think about other cases on your own. So if there's one lie, a simple case where there's one lie is d says 2 plus 2 equals 4. C says d is telling the truth. B says, C says that, sorry. B says, C says that D is telling the truth. And then A tells the one and only lie and makes the statement that uh, B denies that C says that D is telling the truth. So there's one lie, but A does not make the given statement. Uh, the other extreme case is the one where D tells a lie in the first place. D says 2 plus 2 equals 41. C reports that D said that. B reports truthfully that C says that D said that. And A says that. B says that C says that D is telling a lie, which is the opposite of the given statement. So no matter how you get one lie, uh, A does not make this statement. And also, you can work out on your own if there are precisely three lies. Uh, so B, this happens. Sorry, sorry. B's statement has nothing to do with the actual validity of D. <coughs> I mean, uh, C's statement about D. It's not about whether It D has said something to do with it in that B's statement has a probability of one third of being a correct restatement of what C said and two chances of three of, of being the opposite of that, a lie about what you all heard C say. No, I was asking um, if D said 2 plus 2 plus equals 41. Yes. And then C is simply reporting on that statement. He's, C is not really <coughs> saying that whether that statement is true or not. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, well, C is reporting on whether D made a correct statement about 2 plus 2 equals or not. So C has to know whether D's statement is a lie or not. So, but aren't there two ways C could lie about this? I mean, C could have said D didn't say this, or <clears throat> C could have just commented on the actual, whether, well, the act of stating, D's act, act of stating it or not. Well, D makes the statement, and then C says either D told the truth or D told a lie. Those are the two statements that C could make. And uh, there is one chance in three that C will accurately report whether D's statement is truth or not. There's two chances in three that C will lie about it and will give us the wrong idea about the veracity of D's statement. Each person only reports on the person before them. Each person is only asked to report on what the person before them said. So they, there's only two, each person only make one of two reports. That's right. That's right. Whoa, whoa, no, wait a minute. Um, the last person in the chain can only add one thing. But B could, for example, say C said that D said was telling the truth. Or B could say B says, B could say C says that D is telling a lie. So what, what B, person B is saying is no longer about the veracity of the statement, but whether person C has stated this yes. or not. Uh, OK. Uh, Henry has brought out a very important point. All that B is asked to do is to say what C said without any implication as to whether it's a true statement or not. Yes. Though C is asked to report whether D statement is truth or falsehood. But from then on, it's just a statement about what the previous person said. And you must have played this party game you know, where you whisper some secret in the next person's ear. And by the time it's gone through six people, uh, it has become totally changed from what it started out to be. So things kind of like this happen in real life. OK, let's finish this off now. How many cases of the 16 involve two lies? Four choose two. Four choose two, great. And if there are two lies out of four, what's the probability that D was actually telling the truth? 
Two of the four people are lying. It could be any pair. Mm. What's the probability that D statement is the one truth? Half. One half. And similarly, if there's one lie among the four, how many cases? Four. Four. And three lies and one truth, there are four cases. And these probabilities are respectively six times one third squared times two thirds squared, four for the four cases, times one third cubed for the three truths, times two thirds for the one lie, and four times two thirds cubed for the three lies, times one third for the truth. And if there are uh, if there's only one lie, the probability that D is telling the truth is three-fourths. But if three of the four people are lying, the probability that D is a liar is one-fourth. Uh, a simpler way of putting this is there are four cases involving three lies, uh, one where D is telling the truth, one where only C is telling the truth, one where only B is telling the truth, and one where only A is telling the truth. And in one of those four cases, D is telling the truth. OK, now finally, we're in a position to work this out. And after all this song and dance, it's surprisingly easy. The probability of the statement given D is the probability of S sub A intersect D divided by the probability of D. Probability of S A intersect D which is the probability of the event that D tells the truth, and then A says something equivalent to B says that C says that D is telling the truth. Uh, where are the two cases that that can happen? If everyone is telling the truth, that'll happen. So that's One time in 81, everyone will be telling the truth. And what's the one other case where this can happen? Two people down the same line. Okay, if there are two liars, but D is telling the truth, so we have to take one half, because in only half the cases D is telling the truth, times this thing, which is six times two squared over 81. And that's 1 over 81 plus 12 over 81, which is 13 times 81. Uh, another way of looking at this, if you really wanted to do this the hard way, you could li lay out all 81 combinations of the cards that were in the four Eddington decks, and you would find that pr precisely 13 ways of selecting the four cards, D would have got a red card and A would make the given statement. Okay, probability of D. What else comes into the probability of D? So we've got the one lie and three lies cases. So we've got 181, 1 over 81 plus uh, 12 over 81 plus, now we've got two more cases. What are they? So we've got three quarters of this. Can I work that out? That's eight over eighty-one plus this last one, which is another eight over eighty-one 
and that's wrong. So oh, sorry, sorry. I I I know what's wrong. Yeah. Stupid me. We want to know, given that A makes the statement, what's the probability that D is telling the truth? So let's get this right. The numerator was correct, but the denominator we want is not the probability that D is telling the truth, but the probability that A will make the statement. And that's easy, because that's 181 for this case uh, plus six. 16 over 81 for the second case, plus this one, which is a full 2481 for 41 over 81. That is, the probability in the denominator is just the probability that there are an even number of lies among the four people involved. Okay, So that's the sum of the probability of this case, of this case, and that case. And therefore, the probability of D given S sub A is equal to 1381 over 41 81st, or 1341st, which is ever so slightly less than one third. Okay. That, that is the messiest problem of this genre that I know. OK, um, let me get. I got five minutes. OK, I, w I will introduce the next problem, and we'll work on it after break time. Uh, this was inspired by a commentary I heard on NPR earlier this year from someone at Harvard Law School who was fretting about affirmative action and pointed out that it's a natural effect of affirmative action that the group that is supposedly benefiting from an affirmative action program, even if they are strictly equal in every regard to the general population, end up looking bad as a result of affirmative action. And therefore, that one mustn't draw conclusions based on statements like, such and such a minority has the property that uh, two-thirds of them are in the bottom half of their law school class or something like that. So I was so impressed uh, by this that I decided I would make up an example where two groups were manifestly equal and that in order to make one group look bad, someone set up an affirmative action program. And here is the fallacy that this illustrates. So here's why this has a place in this course. I made this statement earlier, and people have a gut feeling about it. And it's when people have a gut feeling about something but don't quite understand it correctly that you can fool them. So here is what people have a gut feeling for. You want to know the probability of some event. And you say, that's the probability of that event given that case B1 occurs times the probability of B1 plus the probability of A given that B2 occurs times the probability of B2 plus and so on, plus finally the probability of A given that B sub N occurs times the probability of BN. And this is true if the B sub I are a disjoint partition of the event space. That is, if if precisely one of the B's happens, then this is a valid statement. But if the union of all the B's is something less than the whole event space, this line of reasoning is phony. So I'll give you the scenario now. Uh, of course, it involves bearded men. 
And this is the tribe where the young men face off at tug of war. And the outcome of the tug of war contest is determined absolutely by the number of letters in the contestant's last name. First names. If they both got the same number of letters in their name, it's a draw. Otherwise, the person with the longest name always wins. And there are actually only six young men in this tribe. Uh, three of them have beards, three of them don't. And within each set, one has a three-letter name, one has a four-letter name, one has a five-letter name. What could be more equal? Okay. But the chief of the tribe is a bearded man, and he thinks that clean-shaven men are wimps, and that he has an obligation to do something about it. And it turns out there's a tug of war academy in the village. And he sets up an affirmative action program for the tug of war academy so that everyone with a five letter name gets into the academy. But as part of affirmative action, clean shaven men with four letter names also get into the academy. And then everyone goes around saying, you know what happens? Whether you have tug of war between academy graduates or between people who are not academy graduates, the bearded men tend to do better, and they're just better at tug of war. Those clean shaven folks really needed the affirmative action program. So I'm going to show you that that's the way it comes out. But first, let's take a break for a few minutes to recover from all this mind bending. OK. Uh, I've moved to a different board uh, because this topic and Simpson's paradox both require more written on the board than I can fit on the other one. This may take some slightly fancy camera work. But let me start by laying out the scenario for affirmative action now. We got three bearded fellows. And they are named Bo, Bob, and Bill. And then we've got three. Unbearded fellas, I will abbreviate clean shaven. Those are Ed, Joe, and Will. And I've defined my notation in the outline. W means that the bearded contestant wins the tug of war. So Bob and Bill will beat Ed. Bill will beat Joe. Any contest between two contestants with equally long names will result in a tie. And in these three cases, the clean-shaven fellow has the longer name, so the bearded man will lose. So does everyone agree that when tug-of-wars occur in this tribe, a third of the time the result is a tie, a third of the time the bearded man wins, a third of the time the clean-shaven man wins? This is tug-of-wars between one person with a beard and one person who doesn't have a beard. So we have a situation of absolute equality. Now, uh, here's the way affirmative action works. The way affirmative action works is that Joe, as well as Will, is admitted to the tug of war academy, uh, reaching down to pick up some of the less fortunate clean shaven men, whereas the only fellow with a beard in the tug of war academy is Bill. So now we can have various contests. Uh, but let's first look at an interesting conditional probability. This is number b in my outline. What is the conditional probability given that someone <coughs> is in the bottom third of his class at the Tug of War Academy, that that individual is clean shaven. 100%, right? And that's the whole point of affirmative action. Okay, so uh, now what we want to do is to uh, define some events which most people will mistakenly conclude are a partition of the space. So I'm going to make this not a complete partition, just so you won't be fooled. Event A1 is when we have a tug of war, it's between two 
Academy graduates and a two is between two Academy non-graduates and it becomes painfully obvious what's going on is if out of these nine equally likely events I identify the ones that constitute A1 There's A1, right? Bill, the only bearded person at the Tug of War Academy, faces off against either Joe or Will. And the other case is where Ed, the only clean-shaven man who's not at the Tug of War Academy, faces off against Bo or Bob. Now, What's the probability, given a contest between two people at the academy, that the bearded man wins? One half. And what's the probability that the bearded man loses? Given two people who are not at the academy, what's the probability that the bearded man wins? And the probability that the bearded man loses? None. OK, so here we have two strictly equal groups. We set up a thoroughly conventional affirmative action program. And everyone says, or everyone with a beard said, I told you so. Just read the tribal sports page. You read about contests at the academy. And the bearded men win half the time. And the clean shaven folks never win. And if you look at the folks who weren't good enough to get into the academy, the same thing happens. The only people who ever win are the bearded ones. And so we've looked at the academy case. We've looked at the non-academy case. Bearded men are just plain better at tug of war, which is manifestly false, because we know everything is equal. OK, what's the fallacy? What else do we need to put in to get a complete partition? Yeah, Owen? You need to have the, the people at the academy competing with the people who are not at the academy to show that you know there are more non-bearded people yes, at the academy. Yes, that's right. So Owen's got it exactly right. Let's identify a three here. This is a contest between a bearded person at the academy and a, sorry, a non-bearded person at the academy and a bearded person who's not at the academy, which if contestants are chosen, each with probability one third, this is actually the most likely thing to happen. And then there's this little case here. Now, A1, A2, A3, and A4 form a complete partition. So we can now state correctly, this is true, the probability that the bearded man wins is the probability that the bearded man wins in case A1, multiplied by the probability of case A1, which if all pairings are equally likely will be 2 out of 9 plus the probability of a win in case A2 times the probability of case A2, which is 2 out of 9, plus the probability of a win in case A3 times the probability of case A3, which is 4 out of 9. And then we add on the probability of a win given case A4 times the probability of case A4, which is 1 in 9. Okay, now this is looking pretty good. This is a half times 2 ninths plus a half times, whoops, that was 2 ninths, not 2 thirds, times 2 ninths plus, what's the probability that the bearded man wins in case A3? Zero. plus the probability of a win in case A4, which is 1 times 1 ninth, 
That's a ninth plus a ninth plus a ninth, which is a third. And we knew the bearded man overall will win half the time. So if you have a complete partition, everything works. Let's just check for the probability that the bearded man will lose. What's the probability that the bearded man loses in case A1? Zero. In case A2? In case A3, 3 out of 4. And that case happens 4 ninths of the time. And in case A4, it's 0. And 3 fourths times 4 ninths is 1 third. So as long as you have a complete partition, uh, everything comes out right. But next, next time you hear uh, statements being made about affirmative action programs and their consequences, do bear this in mind. Because I think a lot of what goes on with affirmative action is, uh, is related to this phenomenon that people look at the union of this and this and don't realize they haven't partitioned the whole space. And the sad fact is that you know, if we attribute malice uh, to the chieftain here, if you have two strictly equal groups and you want to create the appearance that one of them is inferior, the simplest way to do it is to set up a conventional affirmative action program. On the homework is a very interesting question. What happens if the academy actually works? So in the homework problem, the academy is successful. Every graduate gets to add one more letter to his last name. And it turns out that in spite of the fact that the academy is a success and benefits twice as many clean-shaven men as bearded men, if you look at A1 and A2, it still looks as though the bearded folks are better at tug of war. Yes? I lost you at the definitions of A3 and A4. A3 and A4 are, A4 is the case where you have a bearded, where you have a bearded academy person against a clean shaven non-academy person. And case A3 is you have a non-bearded academy person versus a bearded non-academy person. Again, the last one. The, the last one is you have Joe or Will, who are the clean-shaven fellows at the academy, yeah. competing against Bo or Bob, who are the no. bearded men who didn't make it into the academy. OK? Yeah. Now, I'm going to skip over genealogical inf inference. Uh, this is a question based on an actual family occurrence. I'll tell you how it arose, and then you can study it for yourself. Uh, my wife edits the Journal of the Rhode Island Genealogical Society and spends a lot of time doing research into uh, Rhode Island colonial history. And one of her current projects is to uh, republish the 1774, I think, uh, census of Rhode Island. Turns out this was published in the 19th century, but the person who transcribed it figured blacks, Indians, who cares about them, listed all the white people and just listed numerical totals for the minority. So my wife is busily republishing this town by town with all the minorities properly identified, and she's become busy trying to identify as many as she can of the minorities who lived in Warwick, Rhode Island at the time of the census, and has done a pretty good job of it. And she uses a curious bit of inference. I didn't know this until I saw her list of names, but it turns out, at least in colonial Rhode Island, slaves were frequently given classical names, like Caesar and Pompey and Cicero. And uh, so she had someone who was named Samson somewhat or other. And she said, I don't know anything about Samson or so on. But Samson, that's a real classical name. This, this was probably a slave, and I'm going to make a guess that this is a minority person. Well, a week later, she discovered that Samson was a family name, and uh, this was actually a son of a long-standing Rhode Island family, and no minority at all. But I said, uh, you know, Cherry, you're using Bayesian inference. Uh, you're using conditional probability. That's really good. She, I didn't know I was doing that. But what she was doing was she was saying, basically, as a result of her knowledge of colonial Rhode Island, 
she's in a good position to estimate the conditional probability given that x was a slave rather than a free person that x would have been given a classical name. And then she was using the rules of conditional probability to estimate the conditional probability the other way, knowing nothing about x than that x's first name was Pompey or Caesar or Cato or Cicero. She was estimating the probability that that person was a slave rather than a free individual. And you can work out this rather simple case, because what I want to do with the rest of tonight is Simpson's paradox, uh, which I think must be the most discussed issue in all of probability theory. And if you want to confirm that statement, type Simpson into Google, and you will get so many hits you can't count them. I, I stopped at 300. Uh, but there may have been thousands. And it really looks as though everyone who writes on this subject uh, writes about it as though he or she is the first person to notice this phenomenon. Can I just ask a question about that real quick? Yes. The, 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 the last question. Um, just the, the significance of the, the probability of winning and losing not, any, not adding up to one is that you There are ties. Take... A third of the time, there's a tie. Right, but 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 also that that some of the cases need to be taken into account where the the so the wh why don't the probability of winning and losing add up to one? Like you, you either the probability of winning and losing don't add to one because we had these three ties down the diagonal. Uh, but actually, there's. If one applied the formula correctly with an incomplete partition, you're absolutely right. The sum of wins, losses, and ties would not add up to one, and you'd know that something was wrong. And uh, what people say, without thinking about it, is tug of wars between academy graduates and non-academy graduates roughly equal because half the people in the tribe go to the academy. And noting those two probabilities are equal. They don't say they each have a probability of two ninths, which is correct. They say, yeah, those are probably about equally likely, and we'll average together the conditional probabilities. So here is the classic uh, Simpson's paradox situation. And I'm going to present this completely backwards from the way that it uh, is usually done. Uh, I'm going to present this as here is how to apply your knowledge of probability to do fraudulent marketing. So <laughs> this is a highly remunerative skill that you can be learning from this course. And here's the scenario. You're in the marketing department of a drug company, which is probably these days bigger than the research department of the drug company. Um, you have a drug that you're trying to sell into a competitive market. And I want to identify right off the bat the three events that are involved in every Simpsons paradox setup. So I'm going to set up the raw data over here. And we may have to pan back to this. So there are always three events in the Simpsons paradox thing. And you're going to be asked to invent one of these yourself on the homework and write a marketing paragraph about it. So event A is the success. event. And in the classic scenario, it's the drug works. It's successful, and it cures someone. As an alternative scenario, you might be the agent for a baseball player. And success is your player goes to bat and actually gets a hit. Okay. Event B. is what I'm going to call the my product event. That is my drug rather than the competitor's drug was used. And event C, this is what makes this interesting, is the test group event.
And in the scenario I'm going to consider explicitly, because it's the one that's done in the book, it'll mean it was tested by a man rather than by a woman. So uh, an event is going to be the intersection of A or its complement with B or its complement or C if its complement. So a typical event is a man tried my competitor's drug and it didn't work. Or a woman tried my drug and it failed to work and so on. So you can see any intersection like A intersect B complement intersect C complement is the outcome of one of these drug trials. For some reason, these are usually presented in terms of actual numbers. And I'm going to present them entirely in terms of probabilities, because uh, one can discuss this entirely in terms of probability. OK, now here's the raw data. We've got a lousy product. Uh, and uh, our competitor's product is apparently in every way superior, but our stockholders want us to show that our product is better. Now, it's in the nature of this sort of drug. This general class of drugs works very badly on men and very well on women. So, here's the situation. The probability of event A, the probability of a cure, conditioned on B intersect C is 0. That is, if you take my drug and test it on a man, it never works. Our competitor's drug isn't much better. The probability of a cure when our competitor's drug is tested on a man is still pretty small. It's only one ten, but for a man, if a man asks which of these drugs should I go, should I use, the honest answer has to be you better tie our competitor's drug. That has a small chance of our working, whereas ours has zero probability of success. However, this drug is great on women. To be precise. If we test our drug on a woman, this is our drug on not a man, uh, we get a cure three quarters of the time. Unfortunately, our competitors are even better. If you test their drug, that's B complement, on a woman, it always works. So we got a lousy product, and the job of the marketing department is to design a medical study that can be published in a journal, which when read by the public or reported on late night TV, will convince the public that we have the superior drug. And uh, here's, how, here's how we do it. Clearly, what we want to do is to arrange that in the study, there's a very high probability that the person who chooses to test our drug is a woman, while there's a very high conditional probability that someone who tests the competitor's drug is a man. And this conditional probability, which the public will overlook, is um, under the control of the people who design the study, who these days might actually work for the marketing department, for all that I know. So what we're going to do is arrange so that the conditional probability of C given B, I've rigged these numbers so they'll work, is one ninth. That is, given that someone is testing our drug, the probability that that person is a man is only one ninth, which means, of course, the conditional probability that someone testing our drug is a woman is eight ninths. But for our competitor's drug, we're going to set things up so that the conditional probability of C, the test subject, is a man, given B complement, it's our competitor's drug, is 10 elevenths, whereas the conditional probability of a woman being the person who's testing our competitor's drug is only 1 11th. 
How do we do this? Well, it's very easy. We take our product, we package it so that the way is it, it is administered is you put this cream on your face and sit there for half an hour, and we advertise it only on HGTV, Home and Garden TV. Whereas for our competitor's drug, we package it up, package it up in a form where immediately on taking it, you have to drink two beers, and we advertise it only at halftime on football games. <laughs> and then we just let the data roll in and, and report them. So, um, OK, let's, let's work some of these things out now. Um, clearly, uh, we want things to look honest. And so we want the fraction of men in the study to be roughly one half and the fraction of times that our drug rather than the competitor's drug is used to be roughly one half. And what I'm going to do to make that happen is I'm going to choose the probability of event B to be 9 twentieths. That is, we will use our product 45% of the time and the competitor's product 55% of the time. <laughs> now, the rest, this, this is so simple when you understand it. Uh, the rest is just an exercise in working out conditional probabilities, and you can help me with it. So um, we have the probability of success conditioned on the four possible combinations of B and C. <coughs> and to get the overall probability of success on A, we just need to know the probability of these four cases, don't we? So let's work these out. The probability of C intersect B. The probability of C intersect B is the probability of C conditioned on B times the probability of B. The probability of C conditioned on B is what? One ninth. One ninth. And the probability of B is nine tenths and uh, nine twentieths. So this says that in one twentieth of the conditional of the clinical tri trials, our product will be tried by a man. That's looking pretty good. Since this doesn't work on men, we want to keep that number nice and low. Uh, the probability of C complement intersect B, the probability that in a given trial a woman will be using our drug is the conditional probability of C complement intersect B times P of B. And that's uh, 8 ninths times 9 twentieths, which is 0 0.4. OK, so there's the 45% of the time that our drug is used. In only 5% of the trials, it's being used by a man. In the other 40% of the trials, it's being used by a woman. Let's work out the others. The probability of C intersect B complement, which means our competitor's drug is being tested by a man, is the conditional probability of C given B complement times the probability of B complement. This probability uh, was set up over here to be 10 elevenths, because remember, this is being peddled to men. And so the probability that the person who chooses to use it is a man is this nice high 10 elevenths. And 55% of the time, our competitor's drug is being used in the test. So that gives us precisely 1 half. And finally, the probability of C complement intersect B complement. That is, the probability that in one trial of the drug, of a drug, the competitor's drug is being used, and the person it's being used on is a woman, is the probability of C complement intersect B complement times the probability of B complement, which is 1 11th times 11 twentieths, which is 1 twentieth. So this is 0 0.5 and this is 0 0.05. And you take these four things, 
and they sum to 1. So these are, this is a partition of the entire space of tests. It's either our drug or theirs. It's either being tested by a man or it's being tested by a woman. And the probabilities for those four cases sum up to 1. OK, now we publish the results. So this is from the medical journal. And the way this sort of thing is usually broken down in the medical journal is they try to be fairly scrupulous about this. They say, we're going to report the, draw, the results separately for men and for women. And we've got ours, which is B, and theirs, which is B complement. in both cases. And really, I should have a three-dimensional blackboard, shouldn't I? Because you're all used to these two-by-two two grids where we have two events. Now we have a two-by-two-by-two two two situation, but because we can't put this one in front of the other one, we have to put them side by side. But really, we're trying to present eight different intersections here because we want to report the probability of a cure or a failure in each case. OK, now let's fill in this. And the eight probabilities we fill in have to sum to 1. Because the entire outcome is either we used our drug or theirs, we used it either on a woman or a man, and it either worked or it didn't. OK. so. Given our drug used on a man and getting a cure, what's the probability of that? Zero, because our drug never works on men. Uh, our drug was tried on a man and no cure resulted. Well, 5% of the time, our drug is being tried on a man and it always fails. OK, um, now in 40% of the cases, our drug is being used on a woman. And when our drug is used on a woman, this, our drug works pretty well on women. It's successful three quarters of the time. So we've got two things here that have to add to 0 0.4. What's the probability of a cure in this case? 0 0.3 and 0 0.1. Our competitor's drug is used on women, but because women don't like taking two beers with the pill and tend not to be watching the commercials during halftime, uh, the only 5% of the time does a trial involve our drug and a woman, and it always succeeds. And finally, we have one last set of cases. Uh, half the time, our competitor's drug is used on a man with modest success. It works on, it works on a man one-tenth of the time. So this 0.5 splits into 0.05 and 0 0.45. Now, someone who reads this journal carefully is going to read the correct conclusion. They're going to say, look, when you try this on men, ours never works. Theirs isn't very good, but at least it works some of the time. So if a man comes in and says, which of these drugs should I use, you have to say, I wouldn't be very optimistic about either of them, but the competitor's drug is the better choice. And if a woman comes in, you can say, well, you're likely to be successful no matter what, but you're guaranteed to be successful if uh, you uh, use the competitor's drug. OK. OK, here's what the advertisement says, though. It says, we tried these two drugs 
out on a lot of people. There's ours and there's theirs. Ours is event B, theirs is event B complement. We've got cure and no cure. OK. In the cases where our drug was used and a cure occurred, what's the probability that in a trial our drug will be used and a cure would happen? Zero point three. Zero point three, right? In 30% of the cases, our drug was the one that was used and a cure occurred. OK? All women, of course. Shh. In what is the probability that in a randomly chosen trial, our drug was used and no cure occurred? 0.3. No. 0.15. We're just adding the two tables together. OK? Their drug. In what fraction of the cases was their drug used with the successful result of a cure? 0.1. 0.1. And in what percent of the cases was their drug tried but no cure occurred? 0.45. So we say, look at this. Our drug was successful two-thirds of the time. Our competitor's drug was successful only two-elevenths of the time. And this is what's known as Simpson's paradox. If you break the population down into groups, in each group individually, one of the two things appears superior. But when you combine all the data, your conclusion is reversed. So someone who sees just this is going to go and badger their doctor for our drug. And this is almost certainly the wrong decision, but people get so puzzled by this. Now, I've got to tell you a little bit of the history of Simpson's Paradox. This is from a book I use in a different course uh, that Sturzacher is a co-author of. And it's related to Stigler's law of eponymy. So before we go into this, would someone be kind enough to invent a sentence that correctly uses the word eponymous, which is the familiar form of this? This is a cute word to know. Yeah, it's named after. So for example, the Budapest String Quartet played a concert last night in its eponymous city, meaning they played in Budapest. So eponymy refers to being named after. And what Stigler's law of eponymy states, basically, is every important discovery is named after someone who, however, did not actually invent it. And it turns out that this paradox had been identified long before Simpson came along. And there was someone named Yule who had written about it 50 years earlier. But somehow, it's got named after uh, Simpson. And that's an example of Stigler's law of eponymy. And now that you're aware of this, you will keep encountering things that are named after someone who was not their discoverer. For example, uh, Gregory's series in calculus is named after Gregory. This was actually known in India 100 years earlier. But the funny thing is Stigler's law of eponymy is an example of itself. Because Sturzacher found a statement of this same principle that predates Stigler by 60 years. <laughs> OK, so, uh, so this is named after Simpson, but it's, it's been around for, for quite a while. And it, it's really fun, once you understand it, to uh, read all the papers on the internet. Because only about 10% of them really get it right, uh, or really get it explained well. Uh, OK, um, so now I'm going to slide over here. We may have to pan back to look at the raw data. But here is what's missing. From most of the papers written on this subject. 
This is now the whole story on Simpson's paradox. And as with most things that are mistakenly called paradoxes, this is not a true paradox. It's just something which to the uninitiated appears internally contradictory. Once you uh, understand what's going on in general, the mystery goes away. So people are interested in the probability of A given B, which means if I, if, if I use your drug, what's the probability of a cure? And what we're actually telling them is if I pick someone at random from this clinical trial and they use my drug, what's the probability that they will be cured? And the answer is rather high because we rigged the survey so that most of those people were women. Okay, that's the marketer's art built into this. But we can come up with a nice simple formula for this. This is, of course, the probability of A intersect B over the probability of B. And now what I want to do is write this out in such a way that I can factor a probability of B out from the numerator and cancel it against the one in the denominator. And we'll get a formula that explains the whole thing. So far, we haven't made any mention of men and women, right? Men and women form a partition of the event space. So I can say this is the probability of A intersect B intersect C plus the probability of A intersect B intersect C complement. That's just saying the probability that someone uses our drug and is cured is the sum of the probability that a man uses our drug and is cured, and the probability that it's a woman who uses our drug and she is cured. We still got P of B in the denominator. OK, now I'm going to keep working on the numerator. Um, now, this is the interesting one. B intersect C is an event, isn't it? It's a fancy name for an event, but it's just an event. And therefore, it's perfectly legal to write this as the probability of A conditioned on the occurrence of the event B intersect C times the probability of B intersect C. This and this are the same by the definition of conditional probability. And similarly, this one can be written as the probability of A conditioned on B intersect C complement times the probability of B intersect C complement. And we still got this pesky P of B sitting around in the denominator. And the nice thing about this is the raw facts about the behavior of this drug are contained in the probabilities like this. The really medically important thing is what's the probability that it will work if it's our drug and a man who's testing it? if it's the competitor's drug and a woman who's testing it, and so on. So now we've got the raw data that really matter isolated. And we're almost done. Probability of A conditioned on the event B intersect C. Now I have to write this so that there's a P of B factored out. So here's my P of B. And what has to go here? C conditioned on C. Conditioned on B. And that's where the marketer comes in. Because it was the marketing department who said, arrange things so that when our drug is tried, there is a small probability that it's a man. The, the dishonest design of the test study, as I proposed it, was supposed to influence this probability and keep it nice and small. And similarly, for the next one, we've got the probability of A conditioned on the event B intersect C complement, the probability that our, drug work, that our drug produces a cure when it is tested by a woman. And that's times the probability of C complement conditioned on B times P of B divided by P of B, and the P of B cancels out. So we now have a formula that applies to this. And as I said, you won't find this 
in most of the papers on the internet. The conditional probability of a successful trial, given that our drug was used, is simply the probability of cure, given that our drug was used on a man, times the probability, given that our drug was the one being used, that it was a man taking it, plus a corresponding term for women, the probability of A conditioned on B intersect C complement times P of C complement given B. Let's put some numbers in and see how this works. Okay, For our drug, what's the probability of a cure given that a man takes our drug? Zero. Zero. Given that our drug is being used, what's the conditional probability that the person who's taking it is a man? One ninth. One ninth, right? Over here. Okay. This is your occasional man who likes to use FaceStream and watches a lot of HGTV. Okay. What is the conditional probability that uh, when it's our drug and a woman who's taking it that a cure occurs? Three. It's three quarters. And what's the conditional probability, given that it's our drug that's being tested, the person who's taking it is a woman? Eight ninths. Eight ninths. And so we've got three fourths times eight ninths, which is two thirds, exactly as advertised. And if you think about this, you say, yeah, I see exactly what's happening. You've arranged things so that when your drug is being tried, it's the women for whom it works well who are trying it, whereas for the competitor's drug, now use this to finish it off, for the competitor's drug, we've got the probability, sorry, probability of a cure given that our competitor's drug is being used is, well, what's the conditional probability of a cure when our competitor's drug is used on a man? I guess I'd better write this out algebraically. So we've got B complement intersect C times the probability of C conditioned on B complement plus the probability of a cure conditioned on competitor's drug and a woman testing it times the conditional <laughs> probability of a woman being the tester. So what's this number? That's from the raw data over there. One tenth. One tenth. And what's the probability given that it's our competitor's drug that's being used that it's a man who's testing it? Ten elevenths. Ten elevenths, yeah. He's, Heard all about it at halftime on the football game. Plus uh, the probability of a cure given that a woman is trying our competitor's drug, which is one, plus the conditional probability that a random individual testing our competitor's drug is one eleventh. This is one eleventh, and we get one eleventh plus one eleventh. And there's our two elevenths. Now you can argue endlessly about which analysis is right. I think most people would say our competitor's drug is the superior one. Whether for a man or a woman, that's the one that ought to be prescribed. But there are cases where uh, this analysis is actually uh, is actually the appropriate one. Uh, now let me see if I can reconstruct this. You're in an internet chat room and someone says, oh I'm so interested to hear that your nephew works for Blanc Drug Company. I tried their drug recently, and you immediately start thinking, 
and the probability that you were cured is 2 thirds. Right? Because if someone you've never met before, this is an internet chat room, so you don't have a clue whether it's a man or a woman, if all they say is, I tried your drug recently, the odds are overwhelming that you're chatting with a woman. And you are correct in guessing that more likely than not, that individual was cured. Whereas if someone you meet in a chat room said, uh, I'm interested that you sold your stock in Blog's drug company. You know, I tried their drug last month, and it didn't do me a bit of good. You say, no surprise. It only had two chances in 11 of working. Because the way it's marketed, you're almost certainly male rather than female. So there are real world scenarios where this analysis is valid and real world scenarios where this analysis is valid. Now, your, your, uh, your homework assignment is a much more creative one than uh, some of the straightforward problems have been. Uh, your job is to rig up a different um, Simpson's paradox scenario, just as another example of how you could do this. The, Scenario could be you are an agent representing one baseball player and your rival agent is representing a different baseball player. Success event is uh, the player who's up at bat, either your, a your player or your rival's player, gets a hit. And uh, the test group is batting against lefties or batting against righties. Now, we could imagine a league where all the left-handed pitchers are terrible and all the right-handed pitchers are great. Your guy could be worse against lefties and worse against righties. But if you can rig things so that he's platooned and only bats against left-handers, he's going to have a higher batting average, isn't he? And furthermore, while he may be the inferior player overall, uh, if he's going to be fitted into a complete platoon system, he might actually be the better choice as a result of that. So it's your job to think of a complete scenario, to invent a set of probabilities, and work it all out, and make a table like this, and then write a little marketing blurb that shows that your inferior product appears to be the superior one in terms of conditional probability. And who knows, maybe you get hired by a big time marketing firm on the basis of your skill in doing this sort of thing. But at least you won't be fooled by it anymore.